Hello guys, welcome to another video. Everything in Swift UI is a closure, we know that. But not only Swift UI, also Swift in general depends heavily on closures. But why closures are so important? I think it's a good time to explore the details about closures, especially for those that are not so familiar with the concept. So let's get started. However, let's change the format a little bit for today. Instead of just describing what are the features about closures, let me play with you a little quiz and see if you know everything about Swift today. So it's gonna be interesting. Let's get started. My name is Pete and this, this is Swift and Tips. All right, let's start with the quiz. The first question for you is, which piece of code is a closure? Well done! In fact, all the code here is a different type of closure, but all of them are closures. But let me first define what is a closure. A closure is a block of code that can be passed around your code. That's it. It's just code then you can use and pass through other areas or your app. Maybe code C is the most common way to use closures because it's the classic unnamed closure expression. Actually, this is the default way to build a closure with parameters in keyword to make the difference between the parameters and the return type, which is also included in a closure. But, as I mentioned, unnamed closures are just a type of closure. Let me go back here. And for example, A is a global function. It's still a closure by definition. But also look at that. B is a function inside of another function. B is called nested function. All three of them are closures. But it, there is one big difference between A versus B and C. Since that A is a global function, it cannot capture values. We're gonna talk in detail in a moment. But B and C can do it. It's really important for you to understand this concept because memory management is involved here. But don't worry, we're gonna talk about it in just a moment. So, cool. Let's move on with the second question. Okay, second question. We have here an array of ints and we are using map to transform them into an array of strings. We are using the full closure expression here. But what will be the minimum expression possible for this closure? All right, let's see if your answer is correct. The great thing about closures in Swift is that Swift can infer many of the pieces in the puzzle for you. This is similar to protocols with associated types that we saw some time ago, when Swift can infer types just with the current context. Let's see that in action again. First, let's see map definition. Maps type is actually a generic type value, T, that depends from the color to figure out the concrete type. So here, telling Swift that value is type T is redundant because map already defines T as int. In that way, we can remove value T from the closure. And also, we don't need the parentheses anymore. Cool, what else? Also, we are returning a string. Swift can also infer the return type for us without telling it explicitly. So let's remove the return type then. And this is happening because, yeah, we are here telling Swift that this closure is returning a string value. So, yeah, it's redundant again. Let's say goodbye to this return type. Very nice, it's still working. Also, there is one thing that we have been using in other videos inside closures. You may remember a dollar sign and then a number zero or one. That's something called shorthand argument and it's a sugar syntax to make a reference to the order of the parameters 
in or closure. For example, using dollar sign zero makes reference to the first argument, but dollar sign one to the second one if the closure has more than one argument, and so on. In that way, we can replace this value parameter that is explicitly described in the closure by just using dollar sign zero. Doing that, we don't need also in keyword either. Very nice. Nice. Now we can write our closure in one line. However, in cases when we have a single line, Swift can infer that your return type is that line. So we can then remove return keyword too. Boom. We cut out super short closure syntax. But wait, there is more. We can go further in this example. We could even remove the curly brackets and just call the string initializer. This is happening because Swift can infer that your init is compatible with the element coming from map and keep this super minimalistic closure. Pretty nice, right? These three functions are using something called trailing closures which is using trailing closures incorrectly. In fact, all the three ways are valid, but before continue, let me explain what is a trailing closure. A trailing closure is a special syntax for closures at the end of your function that can be written, if it's the last one, uh, after the function's parentheses. For example, Code A is not using trailing closure, it's explicitly setting the parameter name here, which is a completion, and then we have a failure. Actually, let me go back to some process function. And here, as you can see, we have just a really basic example, but the thing is for you to understand, in this case, function is having has parameter, not a value of a regular type, it's a closure. So, as you can see here, and we will talk more in detail about the type, we are declaring here a completion parameter that is a closure that it's not receiving any parameter and it's not returning anything. However, for the case of a failure closure, we are passing a error, in this case, demo error, and we are not returning anything. So yeah, basically here we are propagating an error in this case, Otherwise, we just do whatever the color is trying to execute here. So going back again, I already mentioned, yeah, this is not using training closure. However, we have B and C. Both are using training closures, but you might notice that are quite different. What is that difference? Well, C is the old default way before Xcode 12 and B is the new one. Some Swift developers avoid C because most of the time it's confusing to follow and instead use option A explicitly leaving the parameter names. For multiple closures at the end, it's up to you which style do you prefer. But honestly, I recommend A as default and B as a secondary option if your closures are with a good amount of clarity in the code. In this example, it's just Really simple to follow up what is going on here, but believe me, in really complex operations, using this kind of approach is a bit harder than just using that. So yeah, in general, I'd recommend you A and B. However, this is for the case of multiple closures at the end. We have just the case when we have just a single closure at the end. In that case, it's really straightforward to use trailing closures as example of D. So yeah, I in this case, I prefer to avoid not using trailing closure for this case because yeah, it's a really great sugar syntax for our code. By the way, let me tell you that code D and A are recommended by Ray Wenderlich style guide. I will leave you that link in the description, but it's a really cool guide for you if you are alone coding and you want to use a, you know, a strong style uh, proposed by the community, yeah, that one is a really good guide to follow. 
We have here this nested function and these statements. What is the value of C? Let's run this to figure that out. There you go, it's 30. We have talked at the beginning that nested functions and unnamed closures can capture values. But what is that? It's simple. We have this value that is initialized to zero, but also instead of returning the operation directly, we are returning a function that is doing that operation for us. In this case, we are just making an addition to value. So everything that is passed by another value will be add to value. And as you can see, operation instead of being a value, a regular value, is actually a closure that is passed by this execution operation. And with operation, we can pass a parameter. It's very really simple. But the key here with capture closures is that this value, this value variable, it's outside of the scope of the closure. So what this closure is doing is capturing the value. Oh, let me let me let me rename value, please. There you go. Because I'm so confused about that. Yeah, again, in this closure, we are capturing result. But that means that this closure is creating dedicated memory, a reference to a new result variable. Are you lost at the point? Okay. Basically, this closure has no idea about this result. This result is not defined here, it's outside of the context. But internally, Swift is creating memory to initialize this result value. But since this value is outside of the context of the closure, Swift will create dedicated memory to retain this result until the end of this closure. So in other words, we won't care about this result value anymore in this execute operation. Once we got the first time captured value from result, we are not worried about this other value anymore because the closure will keep its own version of result. And that's why once you pass number 10, internally, this result value will be captured and then it will keep 10. However, in the second, when we are assigning Y with 12, instead of recreating that again, this closure already has its own version of result. So the previous value for result inside of the closure is 10, then we add 12, we have then 22. And this result value outside of the closure is ignored at all. That's why this zero is not restarting the counting again. And again, it, this will happen over and over until the end of the closure. In this case, we are accumulating 30 until the end. This concept of capturing values is really important for you to understand because one additional thing that I need to mention is that this result variable is captured externally. We will talk later in detail when we talk about arc, but you may guess the thing. This is not going to finish until the complete closure is finished. However, in cases when you have a classes and a closure is accessing any property or making any reference to self, you will have a retain cycle because both objects will be strongly referenced each other. And that produce that memory leaks or a lot of big bugs in your application. So for now, it's really helpful for you to understand that, yeah, closures, naming closures and nested functions produce capture values. Okay, last question. What kind of type is a closure? Well done. Have we saw earlier we captured values? Yeah, this is happening because closures are reference type. If you remember our video about structure versus classes, we will talk a lot about reference types versus value types. And the big difference is that you are not copying the value inside. You are copying 
an object and address memory. So, for example, we have here more or less the same function than we had before in the capture example, but now we are adding some string over and over. We already saw that this string value will be captured by this closure and then, yeah, at the beginning we will have nothing, but once we add more and more strings, we will concatenate one after other. And you can see the result here. Yeah, it's concatenated one after other. But the cool thing here is this one. Y is getting the value of X, but X is just a closure. It's just a type that receives a string and returns a new string. But both of the values, Y and X, are making reference to the same closure. But actually, if we got directly what is the value of the closure X, and we don't pass anything here, yeah, you are getting the same result as result Y, because this was the last executed code here, but Y and X make reference to the same closure. This is also really important to you to understand in your development. When you are passing or assigning a closure to a variable or as a parameter in another function, you need to remember that you are dealing with references. And if you are working with closures in classes or reference types, you need to be very careful about the memory management and capturing values. Otherwise, you will have nightmares trying to debug in your code if you got something wrong there. Finally, just let me clarify that, yeah, the type of a closure or a function is basically this form. When you define what is in the parameters, then the arrow with a hyphen and a greater than, than symbol. And finally, the return type. If it's not returning anything, well, you just declare void that is still returning, but not a concrete value uh, per se. And again, if you don't need any parameter, just remove this and you're good to go. But it basically works like another kind of type in Swift, but it's just this particular syntax. All right, that's it for the quiz. Let me know in the comments how many questions did you answer correctly. And let me know also if you would like to see more quizzes in Swift to, you know, make this kind of videos enjoyable. That's all for this video, but not for closures because we have a lot to cover later. I would like to talk more about auto closures or escaping and of course talking more about arc and capture list because those concepts are really important, but I prefer to dedicate a special video for each of them. Also, I would like to know your score in the description, please. If you got all the answers, congratulations. If you're failing anyone, don't worry. It is great because you already know all those answers, so you learned a lot today. Don't forget that we'll have a special video for WWDC and more videos coming about Swift and Swift UI. Please don't forget to subscribe, leave a like, and thank you so much for your support because you are awesome, guys. Thank you and have a great day. Oh, by the way, if you're wondering what happened with my background, I already explained that in the previous video. I am setting up a new room, so yeah, stay tuned for more decorations in my channel. Thanks.